we're beginning now this uh, Baxter Sponsor Symposium. Uh, I'm particularly happy that they have chosen this topic because uh, it is now a few years since we had this round table in uh, uh, Brussels with Jean-Louis Vincent and other experts and we moved uh, from our original definition of most multiple organ support therapy to the concept, uh, the broader concept of ECHOS, extracorporeal organ support. Basically, what do organs failing have in common? They have the endothelium, the vessels and the blood. And because we can manage blood composition, correct, uh, remove, uh, improve composition of blood uh, through different devices, uh, we can probably support different organs. So by changing a filter, putting an ultra filter, we can remove water. By putting a sorbent, we can uh, support uh, liver failure. But interestingly enough, putting a special wet dry membrane, we can remove CO2. Now, in the past, uh, we are very well aware that, of course, uh, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation was uh, uh, performed and still performed, but uh, this requires very high blood flows and it is somehow a specific uh, therapy for people who may need VA or VV uh, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation with the blood flows in the range of five liters per hour, per minute. Uh, extracorporeal CO2 removal may be a different story. It may enter into the uh, spectrum of therapies that we call ECHOS. So we're lucky enough to have uh, uh, Professor David Pestana from Madrid, Spain. Uh, bienvenido. Thank you. And uh, we will ask him to tell us about this therapy and to uh, describe how it is, how it is indicated, what are the patients, and how we can move forward uh, with the extracorporeal organ support. So, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for your nice presentation and thank you for inviting me to this extraordinary meeting. So I'll talk about the ECOR, uh, extracorporeal CO2 removal. And uh, let me see. Okay, now this is the agenda. This is the, the things that we will discuss in the next 20 minutes. I talk about technology and principles of the technology, clinical use and adverse events. I will talk about the REST study, which probably some of you uh, already know. Uh, I talk about the role of ECOR in severe ARDS, and finally I give you my conclusions. So, uh, although um, permissive hypercamnia was proposed a number of years ago in order to prevent VILI, the ventilator-induced lung injury, uh, however, it, it, was, it has been shown that uh, hypercamnia per se might be deleterious, and it's an independent factor that increases mortality, especially when it appears in, within the first 48 hours of mechanical ventilation. So what do we do if we have uh, hypercamnia? We can, we can move, okay. We can eliminate, we have to eliminate that space, the external dead space. When you're ventilating a patient, your heat and moisture exchanger, you have to remove that. Of course, you know that. You have these active humidifiers, but this is not enough many times. So what else can we do? So it was Luciano Gattinoni who started, I think, in the 80s to, to analyze some prototypes of uh, extracorporeal CO2 removal, and he had nice results, although he had a number of uh, com complications mostly related to hemorrhage. So there was a development in the industry developed this pamphlet system that some of you may be, do you know, it has disappeared from the market, to my knowledge. Um, because it required a uh, high mean arterial pressure, it's actually the, the, the heart of the patient that pumps the, the blood through the membrane because uh, you have to insert a catheter into the arterial uh, femoral, femoral artery and the femoral vein. And you also require a high uh, cardiac index in order to maintain this blood flow. And also it was associated to a number of uh, important secondary effects, especially the uh, ischemia of the lower limb. So, uh, this this uh, approach has been abandoned, and now we, we are using pumps. And um, why not using these uh, uh, renal replacement uh, machines? That, but there are also some other uh, 
um, technologies that are specific for lungs without any uh, renal um, therapy. I, I don't really like this. Uh, I prefer to combine them, and we can discuss that later if you want. So you can use a roller pump, such as the ones that you are using uh, usually with your renal replacement therapy machines, or a rotary centrifugal, which are more bound to the ECMO, for instance. And we talk about them later. Uh, you need anticoagulation, of course, because it's an extracorporeal technique, and you need a fresh gas flow in order to generate a diffusion gradient that you can remove the CO2 from, from the blood. So which are the principles of a core? Well, uh, our CO2 content is very high. It's much more than what you think. It's about 120 liters in, in someone like me, in about around 70 kilo patient. But the blood content is only 1 to uh, 2.5 to 2.7 liters. That means that one liter of blood is transporting only about 500 milliliters of CO2, which is dissociated, bound to proteins, or dissolved. Um, CO2 production is around 200 to 250 mLs per minute. That means that, in theory, if you can remove all the CO2 uh, from uh, just half a liter of blood, you can remove 100% of the CO2 which has been produced. However, things are not that easy. So real performance is much lower because you only remove the dissolved CO2. And that depends on the membrane surface. The larger the membrane, the higher the CO2 that you can remove. But there is a limit, and we'll talk about that later. That depends also on the blood flow, of course. That depends on the CO2 gradient. This is very important because uh, if you have more CO2, uh, the, the CO2 removal is very efficient. So if you have more, you, you remove more. Okay, so there have been some techniques that have been developed in order to increase the CO2, which is free, in the, which is dissolved in plasma. And this means to acidify. And, and but acidification has been, well, there are several um, prototypes also, adding carbonic anhydrase to the circuit, electrodialysis, lactic acid infusion, or even adding uh, dioxide of sulfur to the gas. But to my knowledge, these are only prototypes. Maybe in the future we'll see that they come to the market. Also, another way of increasing CO2 is just to put the, um, the filter, um, the, the, the membrane, before the filter. Um, this is an example of the, 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 the relation that, which exists between the blood flow and the membrane. I told you uh, earlier that, well, the larger the membrane, you can remove more CO2. But this has also limitation because of blood flow. You can see here, and uh, down, you can see, well, well, the, the, the line which is below is the low flow. It's only 250 ml per minute. Even if you increase the size of the membrane, you don't get a better uh, CO2 removal. But if you increase the blood flow, then you can remove more CO2 when you increase the size of your membrane. This is nicely shown. This is in vitro study, which compared three different surfaces of membranes. You have a 0 0.35. This is a neonatal ECMO membrane. You have a 0 0.8 square meters and 1.35. And they compare the CO2 removal. You can see in the slide that, well, the higher the PCO2, the higher the CO2 that you're able to remove. But you can see that there is no difference between this 0 0.8 and 1.35 square meters. So for this kind of blood flows, you don't have to go to a larger membrane. You have to find the correct membrane for the uh, blood flow that you're using. Here you can see in numbers that uh, you're able to remove up to 50% of the CO2, which has been theoretically produced in the, in the patient with this kind of memory, 0 0.8, okay? If you go further, you don't get any benefit. And what about the blood flow? Then you say, well, okay, let's move up. Let's use a larger membrane with a larger blood flow. So we will go towards ECMO. Okay, we have a problem. This is the rotors. If you're using the, the common routers that you're using with um, uh, your renal replacement therapy machines, you cannot go further beyond 450 or 500 mLs per minute because you create, you generate microplastics. You are damaging the, the surface of the, of the circuit. So, okay, let's use these rotary pumps, which are being used, that they don't touch, really. The, there is no physical contact with the... With the with the um, system, with the plastics. But the problem is that you generate uh, a shunt. Uh, you can, uh, because the, the pump is not touching the, um, 
the surface of the of the um, circuit, but it has then the possibility of recirculating blood. And actually that happens. And that happens at low blood flows, such as 500 ml. So you can see that only 5%, is, well, this is a comparison of different pumps, and you can see that only 5% is really pushed. And the rest of the blood goes um, recirculating. And this is a problem because you are activating platelets, you are generating uh, thrombin, and you are also damaging the, um, the well, this, this slide shows that up to 12 times, maybe the blood is circulating in one of these pumps, and you are uh, also increasing the hemolysis index. So uh, we have a problem. If you want to go beyond 500 mLs, and you want to use these kind of rotary pumps, you cannot use them unless you go to two liters. Okay, two liters is okay, but between 0.5 and two liters, you have a problem of this recirculation, activation of blood, and uh, hemolysis. What about gas flow? Well, gas flow, don't go beyond 10 liters per minute. This is the maximum that has shown any benefit in experimental models. And the most important are the two first liters. Okay, so beyond two liters, okay, you can improve, but the first two liters are essential. You can go up to 10, but don't go further. No need for that. Anticoagulation, which is the target? Well, maybe 60, maybe 80 APTT. And that depends on the ratio between the blood flow, flow and the surface of the membrane. This is evident. Uh, well, this is our, our protocol um, in our hospital. But um, if you have a high blood flow, and a small surface of the membrane, that means that the, 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 the blood is flowing very quickly. You have high speed, no risk for stagnation of the blood, so a decreased risk for thrombosis. But if you have a low blood flow with a high surface of the membrane, large surface of the membrane, then blood is going very slowly, so you have a high risk of thrombosis. So which would be your target? That depends on your blood flow you're achieving and the surface of the membrane you have, okay? Well, this is a protocol of heparin use. Well, it was published I, and here on the, on the left, on the right side from you, okay? It's a, the, um, the protocol that was published. This was a meeting, that we, a consensus meeting that we had in 2019. It was published in two years ago. These are, well, experts, let's say users, common users of, of ECOR. And we reached the consensus, and this is a consensus uh, regarding um, uh, heparin use, which coincides more or less with our protocol in our hospital. Um, about clinical use, I would say it's very easy to use a core. Whenever you are in risk for VILI, whenever you have a high CO2, PCO2, and whenever you are acidotic, use it. If you don't reach these three, don't use it. It's not, it's, it makes no sense. So this is published in clinical care. So we coincided more or less, this is consensus. I mean, this is, there is no major evidence. It's just a recommendation, okay? So whenever you're going to a, a driving pressure beyond 14, a plateau pressure beyond 25, you have your uh, PCO2 above 60 and your pH below 7.25 and well, respiratory rate has been optimized and so on. So, okay, think about the core because if not, you are going to use some VILI in your patient. So today might be, but tomorrow your patient will be much worse. About uh, weaning, very simple. Whenever your patient is stable, you start to reduce the incremental steps of the gas flow. Uh, when it's stable, when you have uh, reached your target, so plateau pressure below 25, you have a, a, a tidal volume of 6, maybe mls per kilo, and you can uh, achieve to get a normal PCO2 and pH. So you start to decrease, little by little, two liters, the incremental steps. If your patient remains stable, you decrease another two liters until you reach a gas flow of zero. You stay for 12 hours, and if the patient is still stable, you can remove the machine. Which are the potential adverse events? Well, hemolysis, of course, and it has to do with the pressure drop over the membrane. So it has to do again with the uh, ratio of the surface of the membrane and the blood flow. This is the opposite of uh, clotting. You have a low flow with a large membrane. The risk of clotting is very high because the blood is stagnant. But the hemolysis is decreased because there is a low pressure drop. However, you have a high blood flow with a small membrane, then don't risk, no risk for clotting, but a high risk for hemolysis. Other advanced events, of course, hemorrhage, your patient is anticoagulated, catheter-related, and air bubbles, which I've never seen, but, well, they have been described because this is an extracorporeal system. Which is the potential use? And let's go now to the clinical use of 
of a core. Well, there's a scarce evidence. There's not many publications on that. There are key series, observational studies, and regarding ARDS, UPD, winning from mechanical ventilation, and as a bridge to pulmonary transplant. I will concentrate on ARDS because there are some more evidence. I don't have time to discuss all the, the studies that have been published, but I want to talk about the REST study. Probably you are aware of this study. And this is, uh, well, it was planned for more than 1,000 patients in UK. Um, the, the inclusion criteria was hypoxemic respiratory failure with a PF ratio below 150. Primary outcome was mortality in 90 days. And the trial was stopped due to futility. And I say, who expected something different? You're including patients with a hypoxemia. Who said that a core is for a hypoxemia? I, I, I don't see the point of wasting such a lot of money in finding things that, well, you're using a core for something that is not indicated for a core. So let's go to the characteristic of the patient, baseline characteristics. You can see that the median plateau pressure was 26, and the driving pressure was 15. Okay, you say, okay, according to your protocol, this, this means that they are more or less in the limit. Okay, maybe they are in the limit. But have a look at the PCO2 and the pH. They were at 730 and 53. No indication for a core. So it's not surprising that they didn't find any effect because actually these are not the patients that are supposed to be on a core. And I will move to something else because I don't think the rest trial refers more, more comments. What are my suggestions? Well, first, select your patients. If you don't have hypercamnia, if you have acidosis and you are not at risk of VILI, don't use a core. Do it early. It's important to prevent VILI. You can do that. I've, been, I've used more, almost 100 patients uh, a core. I can tell you that if you start early, you stop the development of, of uh, this inflammatory response of the lung. I should them. Just try. Maybe you have to increase PEEP whenever you decrease your Thailand volume because there's a decrease of the Thailand recruitment. This has been proposed by several authors, but I, I don't know if there is any evidence of that. I, I just comment that because some people say that you should do that. And in case of hypoxemia, just go for something that works with hypoxemia. Let's talk about nitro oxide prompositioning, but not go for the core, okay? So in this schema that you already know, where is the core? With a low tidal ventilation, low, low tidal volume ventilation, and use uh, also nitric oxide and prompositioning in case you have hypoxemia. So which is the role of ECMO? And with this, I will finish. Let me go back to the EOLA trial. <clears throat> EOLA trial really recruited very severe patients. This is a multi-centered trial, um, PF ratio really very low, or, or a PCO2 above uh, 60 with a pH below 7.25. So uh, the, the trial, well, they, they included uh, almost 250 patients. The trial was stopped for futility, and there was a characteristic, the trial, you could cross over from the control group to ECMO in case of severe hypoxemia. When you had a refractory hypoxemia more than six hours with an SpO2 below 80%, you could go to um, ECMO. Okay, what they observe, the, the authors is that, apparently this is the Kaplan-Meier, apparently ECMO group is doing better, but there was no statistical significance, so they, they decided to stop the, the trial. Um, you can see here the numbers, the, the, the mortality, and I, would, I could argue may, maybe some of the patients that were crossed over to ECMO actually saved their lives. Well, because the secondary objective was a treatment failure, which was defined as death in the ECMO group or death or crossover to ECMO in the control group. So maybe some of these patients, well, in these crossover patients, the mortality was 57%, so, but maybe this, non, this 43% of survivors, some of them was thanks to ECMO, but the rest of the patients actually didn't show any benefit. And let me go to this, this is the appendix, the supplementary material, which is very important, and let me concentrate on this uh, PF ratio. You have a look, when the PF ratio was below 66, these are the patients for ECMO. This is extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. There was no benefit. There was no difference between ECMO and, 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 and control group. However, it was in the hypercamnic patients when they get the benefit. So I say, why are you using such a complex technology, such a dangerous and expensive technology, if you have something much more simpler, which is a core, to remove CO2? These are our criteria that we started in 2017 to use a core in our hospital. We started with the small membrane, the 0 0.35, this neonatal ECMO membrane. And these are the criteria that, that you see that coincide with the, what was being published in critical care a number of years later. 
because they are logical criteria, of course. Um, rail line efficiency, it's in marking red because in the beginning we had to justify the expense to, 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 to spend money and something respiratory for something that was being used with a renal machine, okay? But now we're not, uh, we, we don't need to have a renal insufficiency in order to start our core. So these are our results. These were published in the European Journal of Anesthesiology. It took me a long time to publish these results because I was somehow against ECMO. And I explain you, these are patients with ECMO criteria, the first 10 patients with ECMO criteria that were uh, treated with a core. So you can see here uh, that all of them, 10 patients, had ECMO criteria from a, a CO2 point of view, but also five of them even had also hypoxemic criteria. Uh, you can see that the SOFA score was relatively high with a, a RESP score determines what anticipates the probability of survival. This has been tested. Um, so in our patients, only one of 33% uh, of patients were supposed to survive. Um, so this is what we observe. Uh, well, the time of a core is important because we, the mean was only 91 hours. If you compare that with this ECMO series, uh, you can see that patients on ECMO, they stay two weeks, three weeks, that's very common. So we start five days, four days. That's more or less the mean of our uh, ECHOR needs, okay? We use uh, prone and uh, nuclear oxide. We had a very high mortality in hospital mortality, but look, we weaned nine patients. The 10 patient, was, he, he died during the process, but was nothing to do with respiratory failure. Um, we could extubate five of the patients, and our hospital mortality was very high, but it included one obstruction of the uh, tracheostomy in the ward during the night and the patient died. Another one had a massive um, hemoperitoneum. It was a pancreatitis uh, erosion of the artery and he died also. Uh, another one, he had a suture failure and he had a carcinomatosis and was decided not to go beyond. So I mean, our patients were really sick and they died, but not because of the cause that had led to a core and this respiratory failure. So this is a proof that we should have started the technique. Well, maybe not, but if you are using ECMO, Think about that earlier, please. Uh, so what happened with uh, COVID? This is during the first wave in Madrid. We had a lot of cases, as you know, and my hospital is one of the largest in Spain. So we had a lot of cases all the time. We, ha we have two uh, ICUs. I'm, I'm leading the uh, surgical ICU and there's the medical ICU. So only in, in, in my ICU, we received 142 patients that needed to be intubated. We could use according 11 patients. And I say could because we had only two machines, and they were patients were being admitted five times, five per day sometimes, and well, you know, this was a nightmare. So our mortality was very high. We could not use a core in a proper way. We didn't use it early. What happened in the later waves? We had this massive, but it was less massive. We had one more device, and patients came more gradually. So we could use it better, not in the best way, okay, not optimal use, but we could do something better. So we had a reduction, significant reduction in mortality in these patients. This is double the mortality we had in our intubated patients. But think about these are the worst patients. These are the fibrotic patients or patients that will go into fibrosis. Uh, so just to finish, there is, uh, you know, the ELSO, probably this is another registry that includes a core. I think it's interesting. It's been uh, sponsored by, by, by Baxter and, and there's uh, uh, Eddie Fan from Toronto, which is behind this. Um, this is, uh, well, um, we can invite you to, to take part in, in, this, in this registry because it also considers a core, which I think is important. It's not only ECMO, but also a core. So I would suggest if you want to, you know, you're using a core to go into this registry. So my conclusions, I think a core is useful to decrease hypercarmia, of course. Uh, it's not indicated in severe hypoxemia, although uh, I didn't talk about that, but in our patients, if you, could, uh, if you remember the, the, the figure, uh, five patients with oxygenation criteria for ECMO, after three hours, only two, and after 24 hours, only one remained. We can discuss about why some of these patients improve their oxygenation with a core. Uh, it may prevent the ER deterioration, so I suggest please do it early. If you go late, if you it's five day with uh, high pressures, don't go to record, you're wasting money. What about maybe you have to increase your PEEP, if you decrease your tidal volume, and use nitric oxide or prone positioning in case your patient is severe hypoxemic. Adverse events, well, you're aware it's mostly hemorrhage. We has to do with the anticoagulation you're using, which is related to the ratio of blood flow to membrane surface. And finally, maybe in COPD it prevents intubation, but this is a, there is a study, a release study, which will uh, tell us if this is true. 
And maybe it serves also as a bridge to lung transplant. I don't do bridge transplant in my hospital, but uh, I've been talking about this to uh, one hospital in Madrid, which does lung transplant. I think they're thinking about that, so maybe in the future I can tell you if it works or not. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Please uh, have a seat. We don't have too much time, but uh, I have an urgent question for you. How low can you go with blood flow? What is your minimum? Minimum blood flow, the rate of blood flow. Well, for a core, I would say uh, the minimum should be the maximum. I mean, uh, if you're using a core, you have to go to 400 to try to, uh, maybe 350, but uh, I think it's useless to, to have one 200. So it's it's uh, just removing a little bit of CO2. So. No, sure, 200 not. But we had some interesting results at 350, 380. So I think uh, this also favors the possibility to use it in a larger population. And once you are more familiar with the treatment, you can get the benefits uh, and understand better that this is not really heroic uh, treatment. The, the, in fact, the second question is, do you think this should be uh, in the armamentarium of every intensive care unit? Of course, uh, <laughs> that's for sure. Um, this is very simple. If you're using your renal replacement therapies, you can use this. It's, it, it has no complications at all. But now uh, ECMO is very sexy, if I may say that. So they are ECMO team. And if you lo belong to the ECMO team, now you go to the discotheque and you find more uh, attraction uh, because you say, I'm in the ECMO team. So uh, everybody wants to be in an ECMO team. There's a lot of money in that, invested yeah. in that. We have also ECMO teams in Madrid that go and, you know, this but SWAT. We are, we are in the CRR team. <laughs> yes. So that's less sexy. I, I, I'm sorry. But um, um, the CRR team, um, made size lives, you don't need to move a patient from one side to another, which is risky, which is very expensive, because if you have these devices, it's been a long, uh, we, we do ECMO in my hospital. We have a uh, venous arterial ECMO, which is nothing to do with this, this is for yeah. the heart, and it works Sorry. completely, it's different. Sorry. But venous venous uh, ECMO, we don't use it uh, since uh, many years ago, just because it works. Well, the only ECMO we used in uh, COVID patients, only three cases, and the three of them died, but it was desperate cases. Uh, but um, I just said, just try it. You will fall in love. Because oxygenation actually is not a major problem for me. The problem is hypoventilation. It's your fibrotic lung. Uh, ox ox uh, hypoxemia can be tolerated much better than when we think. So let's concentrate on the real problem, which is stop the inflammation of the lung. You can stop this very early. It's cheaper. It's less aggressive. And if you stop that, you'll see that your patient improves very rapidly. Yeah, you don't need to convince me, as a matter of fact, uh, we use, uh, in many patients, 400 mLs per minute of blood flow in chronic dialysis patients with no problem. So we are very familiar. So the suggestion is maybe get more nephrologists involved uh, and work together in the team, right? Um, one other very quick question. Do you use ECHOR isolated or in combination with CRRT? Both. Um, I do believe that uh the combination, um, that's why I said I prefer uh, to have uh, machines that do both treatments because I can play with the balance, the fluid balance of the patient, which is very, very important in areas. Um, so I can manipulate my patient hour by hour, which is something that you don't do with ECMO. And ECMO actually, you uh, load your patient with fluids in the first hours. And it's, so you're paying a price that it takes longer to remove ECMO just because probably these yeah. two first days of yeah. just giving fluids. You can, a, a core is very stable, your patient. Yeah. And, and I would like to remind the young fellows that uh, when we started this meeting 40 years ago, we had uh, just pieces of the extracorporeal circuit, a pump, a manometer, a dialyzer, a filter, an oxygenator. Now we have platforms that do everything integrated. And for this, we have actually to say that industry followed very much uh, our suggestions over the year, and they are now providing something which is safer. It's extremely important because safety is the basis to carry over a very good uh, therapy.